Genesis chapter 1, and beginning in verse 1. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the unveiling of our sovereign God, his self-disclosure in his word write the truths he has revealed on our hearts and in this be glorified we pray amen i want to ask you a personal question have you ever changed the oil in your car well let's imagine you're going through that process you're changing the oil and you're there on the ground capturing the final few drops of oil in an oil pan an observer then walks up to the car behind you and they watch They observe, they see, and they notice the last three drips. Drip, drip, drip. The final three drops drip into your pan, into your basin. Imagine them then saying, wow, uh, judging by my observations here and the amount of oil I can seize in the pan and the amount of oil in each drip, the time between each drip, I can calculate that this oil change must have taken place over 60 to 70 years. It must have started by either your parents or maybe even your grandparents long before you were born. wonder what you'd say to that. You might explain, uh, actually that's very funny, very funny. Uh, actually I started the oil change less than 10 minutes ago and what you observed in the last few moments bears no relation to what happened earlier on. When I started the process, there was a massive amount of oil coming out at the beginning, and a whole lot of oil gushed out very, very quickly, and I caught it all in the pan, and the little drippings, the three little drips you saw, didn't happen until a whole lot later, right at the end, in fact. So what's the problem here? What's the problem here? The problem is the observer came late to the show. He missed the beginning of the process And he made an assumption, a faulty assumption. The assumption was this, what is being observed now is the way it's always been. What is being observed now is the way it's always been. That's an assumption. It's a false one. And that's the assumption that what is happening now is the way it's always been. The technical name for this is uniformitarianism. You can forget that word and still go to heaven. That's good news. <laughs> the uniformitarianism is really the idea of evolution, that the little, the little drips, the little things we can observe that are changes now, over time add up to massive, massive changes. Uh, and for that to be in play, you need this factor of time. We don't observe major changes, but we observe minor changes. And if you have minor changes over time, it adds up to major changes. And that is the idea of Darwinian evolution. I think that's an illustration that's helpful when it comes to observable science. When we look at life today, we do see very small changes. Uh, Bird beaks become a little different over time in different elements and parts of the world, but they're still bird beaks. They don't become vulture beaks. They don't become something completely different like rats. They are bird beaks. And bacteria, you observe them, and over time you can see various different small changes, but bacteria remain bacteria. 
Uh, we never observe Darwinian evolution ever. It's never been observed in biology. It's never been observed in the fossil record. Let me just say this. If it were true, we should be tripping over transitional forms. Just, just put a spade in the ground. You should be able to find tra tra transitional forms but, uh, to find the dorse, the, the difference between the, the dog and the horse. You should just be tripping over them. And we're yet to find one observable evidence of Darwinian evolution. Dogs stay dogs, bacteria stay bacteria. Biblically speaking, we would say they stay within their kinds. And you can go to the edge and the boundary, but beyond certain boundaries, you cannot make further transitions. You can have def definite breeds of dogs. You can have poodles, you can have Great Danes, you can have great ver varieties, but what you have at the end of it all is dogs. Wow, I came to church, I learned a lot today, amen. <laughs> but for the evolutionists, the assumption is over time, small changes amount to massive changes. Now, here's what I want us to put on the table here. Every one of us, whatever side of the aisle we are in the creation-evolution uh, debate, we all have the same facts available. The same facts. We observe the same heavens, we observe the same earth, and some people say, well, uh, when I look out, I see evidence of evolution. Well, actually, I don't. Well, let's talk about that. The difference is the kind of glasses that we wear. If you believe and buy into the fact that the massive amount of change that is necessary could take place over eons of time, you're making an assumption. <coughs> and the fact that you can't find into transitional forms doesn't bother you too much because all you need is this thing called time. I would say you'd need something observable for it to be science. What you have is religion. That usually goes over very, very well. But if you look at 2 Peter 3, which was read earlier in our uh, service today, the Bible prophesies something called uniformitarianism, that all things happen as they always did happen, and therefore uh, it actually says they willfully disregard, they willfully put out of their minds Noah's flood. They de deliberately ignore, ignore it and dismiss it because the one thing evolution cannot handle is a worldwide flood. Because in a worldwide flood, you would have many, many of the fossils being laid down all over the earth, which is in fact what we find. You can go halfway up Everest and find fossils. Now, fish either jumped really hard and really high, or else there was a worldwide flood and that water covered all of the mountains, as the Bible says it did. In fact, if you look out of your world with a biblical worldview, what would you expect to find? You'd expect to find what we do find, fossils everywhere. 2 Peter 3, it says, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, hear this, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. They've come to the oil change and said, These three drips are the way things are and have been forever. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. So we all have the same facts. Let me ask you this. When do fossils exist? Fossils exist in the present. No fossil is found with a label saying, I am millions of years old. It simply exists now in the present. And the creationist and the evolution, uh, evolutionist has the same fossil in front of them, but they make various de de dating determinations based on the assumptions they bring to the debate. We seek to as assess the age of the fossil. When do we do that? In the present based on assumptions we make. However, we must always keep in mind what we are observing is in the present. We're not able to observe the past. And they say, well, there you go. You weren't there either. Yeah, but I know someone who was. 
God himself has revealed himself in his word and he told us what has happened in the past and that should allow us to now understand the present based on his determination. <coughs> so the assumptions we make are based on a worldview. All of us have the same facts. It's the interpretation of those facts that divide the creationist from the evolutionist. Take the Grand Canyon. The evolutionist looks at it and says, wow, look what just a little bit of water and a whole lot of time can do. The creationist looks at that same Grand Canyon and says, wow, look what a whole lot of water and a little bit of time can do. Many of our assumptions need to be challenged because the assumptions, hear this, the assumptions are not science. Science is not the enemy of the Christian. But faulty science is. So I'm saying be true scientists and be true biblicists. Find out what God has said by reading his word and reading it in context. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 6 because there are many Christians who are in the category of scoffers who mock the teaching of Scripture in the early parts of Genesis. We would expect that from the world, wouldn't we? But we should not expect it from the church. But in recent days, as has been the case for decades, there are so-called Christians who challenge and mock the opening chapters of Genesis as history. But look in Genesis chapter 6. This is God's observation as we read it. Genesis chapter 6, look at verse 17. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth. This is not a localized scene. It's the earth. And the, uh, the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. I would say verse 16 dismisses the idea completely that the flood of Noah was a localized event. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land, in whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. He blotted out every living thing was, that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. If Noah's flood was just localized, all God needed to say was uh, just move about 100 miles. Noah, you'll be fine. You don't need to build an ark. Doesn't make sense, does it? Look at chapter 7, verse 19. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the earth, or the whole, uh, under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life Died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. Keep reading. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. So it goes on. When God uh, set up the rainbow, it was a promise never again to send a local flood, right? No. There have been many local floods. But God never promised I'll never send another local flood. He did say I'll never do what I did in Noah's day again. So with the cards on the table, I'm telling you, your Bible speaks of Noah's flood. Second Peter says that in the last days, some will dismiss it, willfully neglecting it, willfully putting it aside. Don't be part of that group to fulfill Scripture. Stand with God on the matter. Let me give you another illustration. I've talked about the oil change. Let me talk about the power of chance. 
If I had in my hand here a quarter, would have been good if I brought one with me. Um, and I held it up to you and I said, now, if I was to flip this coin, what, are, what is the chance that the coin will come up either heads or tails? What's the answer to that? 100% correct. 100%. It'll either be heads or tails. What are the chances that it will come up heads? 50%. What is the chance of it being tails? 50%. Let me ask you this question. Does chance have the power to make it come up heads or tails? You ever thought that one through? No, because chance is simply the name we give to a concept of mathematical probability. Chance actually has no power. Chance cannot make something come up heads or make something come up tails because chance is not a thing. Chance does not have any power of being. Chance does not have any ability to make anything happen. Chance is not a thing. It's no thing. Say it fast. Nothing. Chance has no power of being. So to say that we're here by chance is a ridiculous statement. We're here by chance. Well, what does that mean? Chance has no power because it's not a thing. It's simply a name we give to a mathematical formula and probability. What we have in our Bibles, as I mentioned last time we were here in Genesis, is historical narrative. This is history written. This is not poetry. One of the evidence among many of that is Genesis 5 where we have a genealogy. And that negates the idea that this is poetry. In poetry, you don't just suddenly go in to say, here's a list of how we got here, of names and descendants. And in our New Testament, we have Jesus, and it's very clear from the genealogies that he descended from Adam. You read Matthew, you read Luke, he's there. Adam is mentioned. If Adam is a metaphor, if he's simply a myth, it's impossible for something real to come out of a myth. It makes no sense. Adam would need to be real for the descendant of Adam to be real. I want to ask you this. Which Adam is not essential to the gospel? For many Christians, they said, I don't believe in a historical Adam. Well, when does the Bible start being inspired? Genesis 12, Genesis 13. What about the New Testament? What when in the New Testament it's assumed that the, the Adam that we read about in Genesis is history? Is that inspired? As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. What, what, was that, is that real? Is that historical? Is that, what is that? So, if the Bible's true, or since the Bible's true, the words of man are in fact not true because they are opposed to God. And here's the problem with evolution. There are many Christians who try to have them coincide, but evolution teaches that death came before Adam sinned. The Bible teaches it's the sin of Adam that caused death. You read Romans 5. By one man's sin, death reigned. When God said to Adam, the day you eat from the forbidden fruit, you shall surely die, did Adam react and say, well, what's new? Everything dies anyway. No, everything was very good. And something went very, very bad when Adam sinned. Evolution said, no, it's been observable all through millions of years. Death was known to Adam and... There you go. So when we come to Genesis 1, I'd like you to go back to Genesis 1. I made the point last time that what we're reading is historical narrative. I want to give a further evidence for that by going to what I believe is the closest parallel passage in terms of Hebrew structure. And it wouldn't be Genesis 2 and it wouldn't be Genesis 3. I'd like you to go to Numbers chapter 7. Would you go with me? Keep your finger in Genesis, but go to Numbers 
chapter 7. This is, again, something written by the same author, not only God, but the same author, Moses, who wrote the first five books. Numbers chapter 7. And I want to point this out to you because what we have here is an account of 12 tribes in Israel who have something of a delegate, a representative, who brings an offering for the dedication of the tabernacle. And what we have in this passage is a structured account. And there are numbered days. I wonder if you can look with me in Numbers 7. I'm just going to highlight something that becomes obvious if, as you read it. In verse 12, it mentions, He who offered his offering the first day was Nashon, the son of Aminadab, of the tribe of Judah. Go to verse 18. On the second day, Nathanael, the son of Zuar, the chief of Issachar, made an offering. Verse 24. On the third day, Eliab, the son of Helon, the chief of the people of Zebulon, his offering. Verse 30. On the fourth day, Eliza, the son of Shadur, the chief of the people of Reuben, his offering was, and it explains what that was. Verse 36, on the fifth day, are you noticing a theme? On the first day, on the second day, on the third day, on the fourth day, on the fifth day, uh, shall you meal the son of Jurishadai, the chief of the people of Simeon? He, his offering was, and it explains what that was. Look at verse 42. On the sixth day, Eliasaph, the son of Duel, you get the picture. Uh, moving on, we can look in verse 48. On the seventh day, mentions Elishama. Verse 54, on the eighth day, Gamaliel. On the verse uh, 30, it says on the ninth day, Abidan. Verse 66, on the tenth day, Ahazer. Talks about his offering. Verse 72, on the eleventh day, Pagil. Talks about his offering. Verse 78, on the twelfth day, Ahira, the son of Enan, the chief of the people of Naphtali, his offering. Why I mention this is because like Genesis 1, we have numbered consecutive days. Very parallel to Genesis chapter 1. Now, what's my point in all this? Yeah, what's your point in all this? The point in all this is we have a passage here that is a parallel to Genesis 1, but no one looks at Numbers chapter 7 and says, the days that we're mentioning here are millions of years. But we have that in Genesis 1, not because the text in any way suggests that, but because of outside sources brought to the text. And in Genesis chapter 1, if we go back there, we see the same structure. Evening, morning, first day. Evening, morning, second day. Evening, morning, third day. We have the same kind of structure, but I'm suggesting that you cannot find millions of years in Genesis 1 anywhere. What we ought to do as Christians is rightly observe science, but also rightly observe our Bibles and move by the principles of exegesis, which is to draw out from the text what is found in the text and not put into the text something from the outside. That's the element of tradition. That's the element of error, reading into the text. What we should do instead is draw out from the text what is found in the text. I say all that because as we read through Genesis 1, it reads very much like Numbers chapter 7. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here we have a statement of divine sovereignty. The word sovereignty isn't there, but it certainly is a concept in place. Sovereignty means that God does what he wants, when he wants, the way he wants, without having to ask anyone's permission. That's exactly what he does here. He didn't say, is this okay with everybody? Uh, everyone okay with this? I want to get approval. 
Uh, I don't want to don't ever be voted out of office, you understand. He just went ahead and created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the, the, the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Well, those who buy into the idea of millions of years have to try and find it in the Bible if they're going to then be also Bible-believing Christians. And many of them used to. It's a kind of a less popular idea now than it used to be. They put millions of years between the end of chapter 1 and verse 1 and the beginning of chapter 1 and verse 2. You might have heard of it called the gap theory. The gap theory. And that there are millions of years between the end of verse 1 and the, end, and the beginning of verse 2. The problem is you never find that in the text. And the second problem with that is you never find that in the text. <laughs> Others say, well, it's before the beginning, except the beginning would not be the beginning. It would be the much later, right? Others put millions of years into the days of Genesis 1. And as I say, you can't find that in the Scripture. They say, but the Second Peter 3, 8 says, the day of the Lord is like a thousand... A day to the Lord is like a thousand years. Well, read the rest of the verse. It says, and a thousand years like a day. That negates that. Well, well to God it, it can seem like a thousand years yeah and, and to God a thousand years can seem like a day it's making the point in Second Peter 3 that God is outside of time and does not see time the way humans do there's no way of reading that into the verse and coming up with the concept and by the way a thousand doesn't come anywhere near a million if a day is as a thousand years you need more than a thousand years for each day to coincide with evolution. No, God is patient and beyond time, and that's the point of that passage in 2 Peter chapter 3. What we have in our Bibles is the Hebrew word day, which is yom, and it's used 2,301 times in the Old Testament, and the only place where it's questioned, the meaning is questioned, is Genesis. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes, poetically, the word day can mean a period of time, but you know from the context whether that is the case or, or, or not. I heard this many years ago. Someone said this, Back in my father's day, it took three days to drive across Texas during the day. Back in my father's day, that refers to a period of time. It took three days, that's three continuous ordinary days, to drive, to drive across Texas during the day. And that's now talking about daylight, the light portion of the day. So it's context that tells us how a word is being used. That's true in English, it's true in Hebrew, it's true in every language. But the days we read of in Genesis 1 are literal 24-hour days. If we look in verse 2 of Genesis 1, we have what is called a vav disjunctive. And we have the word and followed by a non-verb, which is the earth. And what we have in a vav disjunctive is a clarification or an explanation of what came before it. So something is said and then something comes to clarify and explain what's just been said. And there can be no gap between verse 1 and verse 2 because verse 2 is an explanation of verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Verse 2 is describing the process that was in view when God created everything at the beginning. What if we can also go to the book of Exodus? We often say, well, I, I, I believe the, the Bible is the word of God, but I've got an issue with the days of creation. Okay. How about the Ten Commandments? No, I've got no problem with the Ten Commandments. Well, what happens if the Ten Commandments quotes the days of Genesis? What, what do you do with that? 
I'm not sure I've ever had to think about that. Well, let me make you think about that. Exodus chapter 20. Verse 9. Well, we start in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Why would you do that? Well, because God took six million years. To, uh, n- n- no, no. Six days you shall... Why do we have a working week? It makes no sense. There's nothing that happens astronomically at the end of every seven days, unlike a lunar month or a calendar year. A 24-hour period, we understand day and night, but why seven days? Do you know the only reason why? Because God set up the week that way. That's it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, you or your son and your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or your the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father. And that's just the next commandment. It's like this passing comment. Now the reason we do what we do on the Sabbath is because in six days God made everything. So again, when does your Bible start getting inspired? Genesis 12. Uh, well, he got a little weird in Exodus, but uh, Really? No, if you're going to believe your Bible, you're going to believe Exodus 20 that speaks of Genesis 1 as six days. That's pretty clear, isn't it? You actually have to have some help to mess that up. And over the years, we've had a lot of help. So what do we have in Genesis 1? I would suggest to you, if we go back to Genesis 1 again, verse 5, we have the description of evening, morning, a number, and then a day for these days of creation. Evening, morning, number, day. Evening, morning, number, day. At the risk of being very monotonous, because it's certainly repetitious, God says there was evening, there was morning, the first day. So you have evening, morning, number, day. That's verse 5. Verse 8. There was evening, morning, second day. Evening, morning, number, day. Verse 13. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. Evening, morning, number, day. Verse 19. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. Evening, morning, number, day. Verse 23, and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Evening, morning, number, day. Verse 31, and God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Evening, morning, number, day. I don't know if someone's writing something to communicate that these days were 24-hour periods of time, I don't know how they could have been more specific and explicit. It would actually be almost impossible to make it more clear that the days being spoken of here are 24-hour days. Evening, morning, a number, and then the day. So I'm suggesting to you that your Bible teaches six days creation. I used to not have to be controversial to say that. I'm saying that's what your Bible teaches. You might reject the Bible, just realize you're rejecting what God says. You're going to, if you're believing something else, someone other than God for information. You're going outside of this book. I'm saying this book teaches that creation happened in six days. What you do with that is up to you. But I would assume that if you're a Christian and you believe the Bible is the Word of God, you would submit to the Scripture. And that's why this is more than a lecture. This is a preaching sermon. And I would suggest to you that you and I are subject now to the revelation of Scripture and should submit to it. 
and say, I don't quite understand it. I might have been taught many other things during my lifetime, but I'm prepared to sit under your feet and now look out on my world through the lens of the worldview of the Scripture and see if it's in accord. And challenge the assumption that everything has happened the way it's happened always under the same sort of circumstances. There's a freedom to understand that God has spoken in His Word and God can handle any challenge. But there are some big shots, some great intellects who, who believe evolution. Yeah, and I can show you some many great intellects who believe creation. The issue is not who's got the most intellect. The, the issue is who is going to agree with God if in fact or since God has spoken in His Word, there's only one right opinion on the matter. Well, you're entitled to your opinion. Yeah, you're entitled to your opinion. And here's what the U.S. Constitution gives us. It gives us the legal right to be heretics. You actually should thank God for that. Many countries of the world, in Europe, you had to believe what the church said or else you were a heretic and burnt at the stake. Thank God for the freedom the U.S. Constitution gives us. It gives us the legal right to make some dumb decisions and believe some stupid ideas. But I would suggest to you strongly, God never gives us the right to believe anything other than His Word. Thank God we're not going to be prosecuted, hopefully, for believing something other than God's Word. It may come to the point where we are going to suffer for believing when pronouncing what God says on any issue because we take what God's Word and says we're going to live under this. I was actually at a home not too long ago where I brought my Bible and I went like this and said our job as Christians is to stand under the Word of God and I was mocked. That's where society is. It's where many Christians are. William Lane Craig is a guy I will name who mocks people like myself who would take Genesis as true history. He's championed as a, an apologist of the faith, but he, not, he does not defend the faith that I believe. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. He does not. So I'm naming his name, but there's many. There are many scoffers in the church world who would say you cannot buy into God's word on the subject of creation. And I would say they're going to stand before God one day. And here's what I don't think will happen. You appear before God and you say, I believed the Bible and evolution. And God then says, you know, yeah, I, you know, I got away with it for a long time, but then Darwin came and messed things up. Um, and, and, and yeah, you, you do have a point there. Um, you know, it, 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 it did take millions and millions of years. And I don't think we're going to find that. I think we're going to stand before God and hold our head in shame and be like Job that says, who am I that answered you and spoke in the way I did when I knew nothing? You see, God is infinite in knowledge. And because he's infinite in knowledge, we don't know how much knowledge that is. And so we don't even know how ignorant we are. But man has this idea that the beginning of wisdom is to start with me at the throne and asking God to show up and explain himself. And if I feel comfortable and agree with him, then I let things pass. But when I've got a problem, God's in trouble. I literally know of Christians who say, I don't buy into the fact that original sin has affected all of us in the same degree because that would make God into this, 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 and this. And I say, well, I understand your position, but the God who is has revealed Romans 5, and one day you're going to stand before the God who authored Romans 5. What are you going to say to him? So what are you going to say to God? I want to challenge you, just as I've had to challenge my own thoughts, because as a young Christian, I was brought under teaching that said God used evolution in the creation of the world. But I've renounced that because you don't get evolution from the Scripture. You get that from outside agencies. And there are many people with great scholarship who are scientists and Christians. In fact, 
If you go through history, the great movers and shakers in science were often Bible-believing Christians. Science is not the enemy of the Christian. Bad science is. Just as faulty exegesis, faulty, faulty driving from the text, what is in the text, is the enemy of the Christian truth too. God is infallible. And when God has spoken, everything he said is true. And when we stand before him, I don't think there'll be any apologies from God to say, well, yeah, I, you know, Jesus was simply a child of his day. That's what William Lane Craig says. William Lane Craig says about Jesus. That, yeah, he articulated the early chapters of Genesis' history because he was a child of his day. According to his humanity, that's all he had available. Yeah, I understand, I understand that, except he's also God. And as God, he would know whether the current theories of man were true or not. And if he was articulating them, knowing as God that they were untrue, what we've got with Jesus then is not an attack on his knowledge, but an attack on his righteousness. Because if he knew it wasn't true and he said it anyway, he is now lying. And William Lake Craig has to live with that. He's accusing Jesus of lying. That's not a Christ I can defend. Christ of the Bible knows everything and always makes a true statement. He is the truth as well as the way and the life. So in our short time together, what have we covered? We've covered hopefully a lot to realize that what we're looking at in our Bibles is something you and I are subject to that should change us so that we come under its authority. <coughs> and this should be true in every area of our life. So many Christians say, I, I, I know I take the Bible, it's true, but when, it, when it's not comfortable, I, I, I go a different direction. No. What God says on any issue is the issue in your life if you're not in conformity with it. Our job as Christians is not to say, I'm going to believe the bits I like. I think I've related this story before. I was a teenager and still in my spiritual diapers, maybe five or six months old as a Christian. I was at a youth event and next to me was a girl who was 18. Now when you're 14, 15, 18 seems like, whoa, they know a lot. And this was an 18-year-old Christian who'd been a Christian three years. Three years was a lot. And I looked at her Bible, there was someone speaking, and in front of me was her Bible on her lap, and I looked over and saw it, and I saw that there were passages where there wasn't any text. She'd used the scissors and took out some parts of the Bible that she, well, obviously were, they were in my Bible, they weren't in hers. And I, and I say, well, where's your verse 8? Where's your verse 8? She says, I don't have a verse 8. I said, well, why not? She says, I took it out. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. She's this older Christian. So I asked her, why do you take it out? She says, I take out the parts I don't, I don't agree with. That's the one and only Christian, thankfully, I've ever met that actually did that. But I wonder how many other people do that without a physical scissors. They may not have a physical scissors, but they say, well, I don't agree with that part. Or I don't see it the same way Paul. I was just Paul. Well, no, it wasn't just Paul. It's Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit sent by Jesus. You've got a problem with Paul. You've actually got a problem with Jesus. He's a sent one, an apostle. So in summing this up, what is it in your Bible where you've got the scissors out? And I would say put them back, get some sticky tape, and put it back in. And live for the glory of God. When you're under the authority of the Word of God, you're under the authority of God. And have you submitted to the gospel? You might be thinking, well, I'm a Christian. I've got a lot of Bibles in my house and I've got a lot of evidence to show I'm a Christian. Well, what have you done with Jesus? And are you under his word? And is there something in you that's resisting God's word right now? Or are, or are you saying, well, that's someone else's opinion? I understand everyone's got an opinion. But when God speaks, our opinions need to change and come under the authority of God 
found in Scripture. A lot of people say, well, I, I, I serve Jesus the way I like, and I, I say I understand that, but what you've got there is not the God of the Bible. God never says, serve me the way you like serving, but if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, I kind of have this idea that church is kind of man-made. I remember talking to someone, he, says, and he said to me, uh, I'm, I'm not into organized religion. You ever heard that? I said, oh, so you're into disorganized religion? He says, no. He says, what I like to do on a Sunday is just get up and kind of sit in a chair. I've got a backyard and observe the little hummingbird. And to me, that's my, that's my church. I said to him, um, interesting. But what if God has said, this is what church is, and this is how I'll be worshipped, because it's very convenient because the hummingbird never comes to you and says, I don't like the way you're using the internet. I, I don't like the way you're, what, what you're doing with your taxes. The hummingbird is very convenient. But God in his word has spoken and he speaks to the conscience through his word. This is how he reigns and rules. And to throw off the word of God, let me say it this way, is to throw off Christ. Should God say, this is how I'll be worshipped in my house on my day according to these specifics? The Christian says, yes, sir. Not, I prefer this. So I suggest to you that the stakes are very high. The stakes are very high concerning the gospel. And the gospel is not about you and I finding purpose, although that's one of the side benefits. The gospel is about getting right with the Holy God. And the Holy God has come to us both in creation and through the Word of God to tell us what His will is. And we've defied Him at every point with our thoughts, our words, and our actions. But God in His love sent His Son into the world who lived this flawless, perfect life of obedience to God according to the Word of God. When tempted by the devil, he didn't say, I think, I think, I think. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. That's Christ and his view of the Bible. And he lived according to the word of God, being the word of God made flesh. And that life went to the cross, and on the cross, he bore the sins of all those who would ever believe in him, and on the third day rose again from the dead, defeating death and sin and hell and the grave. And is in the place of all authority, and says to us, what will you do with my word? Repent and believe the good news of what I've done in Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for these clear words in Scripture. Thank you for an adult look at something we may have learned as little kids. But the truly converted are those who submit to your word. Give us hearts that would joy and delight in coming under the rule of King Jesus in and through and by the word of God. And in this be glorified, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.